Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining uh, us again on Monty Heights. We had a bit of a break last week because of the Euro PCR conference. But it's great this morning to have Marco Barbanti from Catania join us on a topic which I think is very interesting and one of the really important topics in interventional cardiology. Because I think the topic goes outside of just people who do structural. Um, as more and we start treating more and more patients who are younger, we become aware that we need to think about coronary access and how, you know, if patients who've had a tava valve will need PCI in the future or come in with an ACS in the future, you know, how difficult is it going to be to manage these patients? And particularly because often when these patients come in with a STEM, it's in the middle of the night, it may not be an operator who's familiar with TAVI valves. And so it's good we start talking about this understanding the challenges and have Marco tell us, maybe give us some tips and tricks about how to overcome some of these challenges. So Marco, you've done a lot of work and one of your papers has become, I think one of the most cited papers in this field. So we really appreciate you joining us and, and educating us on this important topic. Thank you very much, Azim. For me, it's a really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I have to confess that I'm a little bit biased about Azim because he's a colleague, he's a friend. And I have to say that this presence is really missed in Italy. So you now you have a great asset, United States. And but I'm I'm very happy that we are keeping on collaborating in teaching in and doing research all together across the ocean. So really is a um, very very pleasure to share with you this important topic, as Azim said before. So um, this very briefly the roadmap of my lecture. So I will provide, I will talk with you uh, regarding the uh, latest insights from coronary correlation after TAVI. So uh, then we are going to discuss some, a few tips and tricks uh, for coronary correlation uh, in a patient with a transcatal valve in. And then uh, we are going to discuss just a little bit what uh, probably at the moment is not a big issue, but for sure it will become in the next future, which is the chronic relation of the TAVI in TAVI. So, but let's start from the, from the first. And I would like to start from um, the story of one of my breaking TAVI case. This was um, quite an old case. Um, the previous uh, uh, history, uh, history was uh, not really relevant, uh, high history of coronary artery disease with a uh, acute coronary syndrome in back in 1998. This patient uh, underwent an effective uh, transcalculate valve implantation with uh, all the first generation core valve 29 with a quite good result. So mean gradient six and just mild PVL. Uh, this patient uh, um, experienced some uh, uh, shortening of breath uh, in 2014 and uh, uh, some kind of angina. And we uh, diagnosed um, uh, severe uh, transcalculate dysfunction with a mean gradient uh, which was more than 40 millimeters of mercury. So at that time, this was back in 2014, our pre-procedural TAVI, pre-TAVI, reduced TAVI consideration. This patient was, uh, of course, an high risk for surgery, STS for 7.4. Um, uh, no oral anticoagulation therapy was attempted because this was a clear degeneration um, because a progressively increased transplantatic gradient. Um, at that time, we thought that uh, no CT was really necessary. The patient had some kind of renal failure and no issues with sizing. We, so we decided to go ahead with our same platform size. Uh, so by implanting uh, Evo R29, a same implantation depth. And that was at that time the procedure, which was um, very straightforward. Um, this was uh, uh, nearly zero contrast because we have a very big um, uh, uh, marker, a fluoroscopy marker in, we implanted a valve at the same size with quite good result. And I have to say that we were quite happy. What happened three years later? Three years later, this patient came back with a, a acute coronary syndrome. He underwent for selective coronary angiography, but it was impossible to obtain selective cannulation of both left main RCA. <laughs> So that was uh, basically, um, fortunately, this patient did not have any significant stenosis. So it was just um, Inoka, Inoka. So no requirement for PCI, but that was the first, um, uh, the first episode that tend me to say, well, probably we're gonna have some troubles in reaccessing the chorus in this patient. And actually, if we see the CT post, that is not very high quality, was one of our first CT posts. 
you can see here that it is in front of the origin of left may basically completely a barrier which impede any kind of uh, um, engagement. So the question at that time was uh, why achieving optimal future coronary access is key in transcatheter valve. It's not just because this case for airport. There are many factors that um, uh, suggest that this is very important to preserve coronary access in these patients. First of all, is the prevalence of coronary artery disease, which is not negligible. Indeed, this is remarkable. And we see that there are many patients uh, undergoing TAVI with some kind and value degrees of coronary artery disease. So the prevalence of coronary artery disease is significant. And also, if we see the outcomes of patients uh, who had acute coronary syndrome in which there is already a TAVI, um, we know that one of the major driver for prognosis was whether or not these patients uh, were revascularized. And we see here that the revascularization at the time of acute coronary syndrome was the only predictors of uh, reduction of all risk of all cause death, as you can see also from these curves. So there is an important, there is a high prevalence of CAT in this population, and there is an important impact on uh, um, of uh, coronary revascularization in this patient. So uh, revascularize these patients definitely matters. And also, um, this is a, most re a more recent paper on uh, patient uh, multi-center retrospective strat um, uh, study involving 38 centers. Um, uh, all patients uh, uh, had a STEMI, and um, the incidence uh, in patients uh, who had a STEMI uh, was open with TADI, it was 0.3%. And this patient population was, com were com was compared with a population with a TADI inside. And what do they mean for the outcomes of this uh, study? We showed that the presence of TAVI was not also in this case negligible. So uh, the TAVI um, conferred a 33% longer total balloon time with fourfold higher PCA failure. And this was associated also with a significant increase in mortality up to one year. So once again, it means that acute coronary syndrome in these patients had a good and important, um, as an important uh, imp clinical impact, but also is important try to re-engage the coronaries in the fastest and safest way and op uh, obtain the opportunity to do PCR. But of course, uh, 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 going deeper into this uh, topic, uh, there are some um, predictors and uh, factors that could impact on coronary access after time. And of course, some of them are just uh, uh, anatomical, so typical of the, the patient we have, and some of them are device and procedure related. Regarding the anatomical factors, uh, all of them pertain on uh, the dimension of the aortic root uh, structures, including the sinotubra junction, the sinusobal salva, the coronary 8. And regarding the device and procedural aspects, um, first of all, uh, it's important the orientation of uh, the commissures the ceiling, skirt eight, and also the valve implantation depth. We are going to assess all these factors one by one in this lecture. And of course, not all tabs are the same. This is basically, this is a drawing basically summarize all the uh, valves we are uh, currently implanting uh, in Europe, but it's also in the United States, some of them, most of them. And basically when we uh, assess the feasibility or the easiness of uh, uh, engaging the coronaries, in terms of transcatheter valves, we have to consider a few aspects. The first aspect is uh, the uh, height of the frame. So we can compare short frame versus long frame, uh, long frame, long frame transcatheter valves. We have valves with open cells, valves uh, with closed cells, and we have uh, valves with supranal leaflets and valves with intranal leaflets. Of course, short frames, open cells, and intranal leaflets are all factors that um, all features in a valve that um, uh, um, increase the chance to obtain a coronary access. But of course, it doesn't mean that um, uh, the valves with long frame uh, closed cells and supranal leaflets are bad valves. Of course, we're gonna see, we are gonna move uh, that to a very highly tailored approach to our patients. So all these factors are factors to consider when we are deciding what type of valve we are to implant in our patient. So we just say that uh, valves, transcatheter valves carrying such features, so closed cells, supranularity, 
and uh, uh, tall frame may be associated with increased risk of uh, coronary access impairment. And actually, this was demonstrated from this meta-analysis showing that actually the successful left main RCA angiography was much higher with uh, balloon expandable valves as compared with the phonic valves, even though this uh, um, uh, was uh, associated with a similar success of PCI, even though there was uh, um, some numerical difference between the two valves. And this was basically the background which uh, um, stimulated us to design the reaction study. The reaction study was a prospective study. It was actually the first investigating how um, uh, the effectiveness and of a coronary in a, in a uh, prospective way the, of coronary cannulation after the valve implantation. We included um, 300 patients, and the valves we used were the accurate NEO the Evolut R, Evolut Pro device, and the Sapien 3 device. The primary outcome was indeed the unsuccessful coronary cannulation after transcatal valve implantation. So we performed piece, uh, coronary angiography before and after coronary angiography. And the secondary outcome was uh, the um, assessment of aortic root uh, CTA measurement and persistence implantation related factors associated with the inability to selectively cannulate coronary after transcatheter valve implantation. So these were the two main outcomes. What about the first? It was absolutely uh, probably predictable, but at the same time, quite surprising to see that unsuccessful coronary cannulation um, after TAVI was observed in 7.7% of patients. But even more importantly, 22 out of 23 cases of unsuccessful cannulation were observed with evolute valves. And another finding of this study was that RCA cannulation of the TAVI was much more difficult as compared with the left main cannulation. And this was demonstrated with a high rate, 31% more or less of unselective coronary cannulation of the transcatheter valve implantation. So also demonstrated with uh, as compared comparing right versus left uh, coronary artery engagement, much more time to cannulate and much more contrast dye used. But another important um, aspect, another important finding of this study were the predictors of successful cannulation. We basically were able to identify three of these predictors. The first one, just start from the down, from, the, from down here, was the use of every valve. So the use of this valve was associated with 30 times increase of having um, unsuccessful coronary cannulation after transcatheter valve implantation. But not only the valve, it's also how we size this valve and how we implant this valve. Indeed, um, implantation death were associated with an increased risk of unsuccessful coronary cannulation. So the higher the implantation of this valve, the higher the chance to have unsuccessful coronary cannulation. So this is a very important considering that our tendency is to implant as much higher as we can to prevent conduction disturbances. But we can discuss this about, that, about this important topic in the discussion. And the third aspect were the relation between the valve and the sinus of valve. So the higher the oversizing of the valve as compared to the sinus of valve, the lower the space to maneuver the catheter, so, so to obtain a good engagement. So these were the main results of the study. The one, one main limitation of the reaction study, that was that actually the commission alignment was not obtained. So this was designed in a period before we are doing systematic commercial alignment with self-expand device. And we know that in one th more than one third of patients, we have a severe commercial alignment. And we know also that with some valves, we can obtain quite a reproducible uh, commercial alignment of the scattered valves. So this hypothetically might increase the chance to obtain uh, commercial alignment, it could be the, uh, the coronary cannulation because we are not placing the post of the valve just in front of the coronary ostia. And this was actually demonstrated by in a recent study by the Padua groups showing that um, the uh, commercial alignment was a significant predictor of successful coronary cannulation after transcendental valve implantation. So it means that uh, we have a problem, and this problem is particularly uh, true with the self-expanding supranormal device. We still are in the way to solve it, uh, to, um, um, to do that. First thing to do is try to obtain commercial alignment. So any single device, any single device should be implanted by aiming at least 
um, to a commission alignment to increase the chance of having um, a, com a coronary cannulation. So if we want to go back, uh, considering this background to our consideration for the patient I just presented. So this way consideration back in 2014, probably I would completely um, uh, change my uh, strategy to this patient. And uh, I would change with this. So of course, this patient, the first three steps will be the same. The, but the CT, I think today, to screen potential history of recurrent access, I think in this uh, scenario is uh, uh, mandatory. Also, tailored uh, THP type and size and implantation depth should be considered. So not all type of valve are the same for this, uh, um, in bearing this in mind. And also careful selection of commercial orientation of the first valve has an important impact in terms of, uh, um, uh, in terms of patient uh, and uh, chronic ablation. So having this uh, lesson in mind, I want to present another case that was much more recent. Um, and this was a patient with an uh, um, extensive history of coronary artery disease with multiple PCR. This patient uh, uh, was, uh, um, from an anatomical standpoint, a quite regular patient in terms of uh, sinus oval salva, arnus, and so on. So this patient, uh, as a basic consideration, was suitable for TAVI, annual dimension, good for all types of valves, mild LB calcium, no horizontal aorta. But now we, have, now we have to do some advanced considerations, including the presence of coronary artery disease. And in this case, there is a patient also placed in the left main osteum. Um, of course, you consider also the commissural alignment. We can see here also how important is in this term the protruding of uh, uh, the left main stenting here in the sinus of Alsalva. So in this patient, we adopt a highly strategy and a highly tailored approach First of all, we did some PCI, but this is quite remarkable on osteum on the RCA. But then we decided to go with a valve, which uh, allow us to obtain a good commercial alignment with the very open cells. So in this case, we use an accurate new device using a, um, a cusp overlap view. Um, you can see here, we implant the valve. We were able to obtain a quite good result, but in terms of coronary access, we were absolutely able to, you see here, to easily engage the coronaries. Here we go. And the left was the same, the right was the same. So what about the second part of the, my lecture? Some tips and tips for coronary correlation, which is the more practical ones. Uh, considering the, the, the reaccess study, now we are running also the reaccess to the study, we, we, we had a lot of uh, um, experience in uh, trying to engage the coronaries there. I must confess that uh, there is also a learning curve in this, uh, um, in these aspects. So I think I will present this case, which I think is uh, really important and explain in just one slide how can it be Tricky and I can be at the same time easy if you comprehend some basic rules. So uh, first of all, we have to consider that the problem of coronary access is mainly with the outlook valve. So with these featured valves. And here you have the valve. You have to consider that in case you're gonna have good commercial alignment, you have uh, quite nice and wide options to engage the coronaries. But in case you're going to have the post in front, and so you're not going to have a commercial alignment, you basically cannot go to the access from here. You have to go from these um, peripheral cells. So it may be much challenging. But in terms of some tips and tricks to engage the coronaries, I think the first thing to do is just to keep the wire in. You can see the wire here inside and try to find a good alignment between the cells and the origin of the ostia. So the first thing is to just leave the co-pilot in and the regular J-wire. And with the wire, you have to aim on the nadir of the cusp, you see here. So just try to stay inside the valve and keep the wire long and straight, and then just push and pull on the wire until you're gonna find the good uh, alignment. You can see here, you do basically have the valve, the, the catheter just impinging on the cells. You're still playing on with the wire, put the wire on the nadir of the cusp, and then you're gonna find a good um, way and the good cells to get in. So this is basically 
the um, one of the one of the, the most important tip in this case. This was one of the cases in which we were not able to obtain a selective core angiogram, angiogram despite all these uh, maneuvers. And this was because the bulb was very high and we were able, you can see here from the spider view that we were not able to go down here. So in this case, an option you can use is try to do like a fishing technique, go with a uh, guiding catheter, go with the wire and uh, hydrophilic wire, and then use, you can see here the wire back, uh, down to the circumflex in this case, and use a guide extension catheter to do the your PCI. So basically this is uh, one of the most important tip in order to obtain a, a higher chance to do the current geography of the transcarbon valve implantation. And we published actually this kind of uh, approach uh, when you have to do um, uh, uh, such a patient, we have in front of you this patient. So first of all, it's important to um, try to select, the, uh, to, to, let, to do a selective current geography. And most of the time, this is actually feasible with a few additional maneuvers. But in case you can obtain it, you can still perform PCI in a standard fashion. But if you are not able to engage the coronary, you basically have to, to, to try to find some coaxiality between the origin of the ostia and the frame you are, you are crossing. If you are still coaxial, but the guide cutter is still not engaged, you might use the, um, uh, the fishing wire technique with the guide extension catheter to obtain a selective current geography. But in case you are not, you have to try it first time to change the cells. And you, if you are not able, while, despite you changing the cells to obtain a, a selective current geography, you can still doing a fishing wire, use again in cash and extension cat, then do selective and current geography. So finally, um, what about the current correlation transcatheter of the valentabin tabby procedure? Uh, but this is a much more difficult talk. Um, and probably the best way to approach it is to try to figure out or to understand the mechanism of what we call the new aspects of uh, this procedure, which is the sinus of sequestration. Sinus sequestration is an entity in which we are going to create a, um, a, a barrier in front of uh, um, sinus, in, into the sinus of valsalva, in front of the origin of the coronary ostia created by the leaflets of the first transcatheter valve, which are going to be folded up while you, after you implant the second valve in. So this is something that is feasible. We can do it. We did a lot of times uh, in, uh, when we had some acute failure of transcatheter valve by doing valve and valve procedure. But of course, this has some consequences. Some consequences because, um, as I said, there is what we call the new skirt. The new skirt is uh, the uh, the eight of uh, this kind of skirt we are going to create caused by the first valve into the sinus of valsalva. And of course, there are different new skirt eight as um, according to the valve we are dealing with. So of course, it's logical to think that with balloon expandable short frame valves, we're going to have a short skirt, the short new skirt. We're going to have a very much higher, much longer uh, neoskirt when we're going to dealing with the supranal device. So we can reach up to 30 millimeters in case we are going to have uh, going to deal with the acronym neo valve. So this is something we have to consider when we are going to deal, particularly with younger patients, uh, in which the long term perspective uh, perspective has an important impact in. Uh, in the in the patient's uh, uh, selection in terms of uh, transcatheter valve. So um, as I say, it is important to prevent this issue, and you can prevent this issue by doing uh, accurate uh, sizing. Uh, bear in mind a few things, uh, which are the eight of the um, of the sinotubular junction, which uh, for many years has been neglected as a structure to consider for TAVI. Now is going to be one of the most important structure when we consider and we want to predict the risk of having some sinus sequestration and any impingement in coronary reaccess after valving valve procedure. Because as you see here, when we're implanting the valve, we are basically um, have to consider that when the single tubular junction, the distance between the single junction is very short and you can still don't have um, any space to go with catheters across the sinotubular junction. So in case we're going to implant the valve inside, you basically have no chance 
to get into the corners. So this is something that should be considered. But also in this case, the type of valve has an important impact. And in this study, which investigated uh, all patients undergoing CT who had two valves in, you can see here that uh, when you consider three anticipated issues for chronic annulation um, uh, after valve in valve procedure, which are the position of the coronary ostium as compared with the neoskirt, the distance between the arctic wall and the transcatter valve, and the distance between the, TH, the two THV struts. When you have uh, the core valve implanted as a first device, you basically have more than 65% of chances of having at least two interfering factors in case of reductive procedure, against the only 17% when you have a balloon expandable valve. So um, this is something important, and it raises the, the answer that is short. Whoops, I think Marco just froze. Marco, are you there? Marco? Marco, can you hear me? Oh, here we go. Hi guys, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what happened. I think, um... Zoom froze. Let's just wait for Marco Barbanti to join again and we'll carry on. The joys of Zoom. Um, let's just see. Let me try and give Marco. Hi guys, sorry, there was a problem with the internet. So Marco's rejoining, just give us a second. We'll continue from where we were. Okay, I think we got Marco back. Azim. Hey, Marco. Okay, I'm sorry for that. No, sorry. I think you know, that's the problem with Zoom sometimes. So we were on Oli the backer's slide. Uh, we've okay. just gone from that to the next slide and then you froze. So we just went from this okay. to the next slide. That's it. Okay, great. So, thank you. So um, as I say, I want to share with you um, this case because according to the, uh, pre the, to the study I just presented by Ole de Bakker, um, uh, is the short THV frame the perfect solution? So this is a 74 years old man with quite a remarkable uh, arctic route, so very normal, very just straightforward. 
And uh, this patient had also quite wide sinus oval salva, but a little bit short, as small sinus tubular junction. So this patient underwent TAVI with a CPIN um, ultra device. Um, after that, there was a loss of capture during valve deployment, but we were able to implant the valve in a quite nice way, no leak, quite grand zero implantation, no leak. So we absolutely, I think everybody would agree that this is just a perfect implantation with the, no, the very high, very good gradient, no PVL. But, and also we were able to cannulate to engage the coronaries because we are dealing with the short frame. We are still have an intra-annual valves. So the origin of the osteo were way above it. But this is just a single valve. So remember, this is a 74 years gentleman. And uh, we know that with the balloon expandable valve, we are, we are not able to uh, orient the commissures. So at the end, by chance, of course, we um, uh, have this uh, valve, which was completely misaligned in terms of, uh, in terms of new posts. And you can see here, you can have the post, two of the posts, one single post isolated here. You have uh, the other two posts of the valves so superimposed. You can see here how the origin of the left main is just almost in front one of these posts. So this is uh, 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 an entity in which you have a severe commissural misalignment. You can see here why quite well of this patient, the commissures. And you can see here the origin of the left main, which is completely um, in front of the posts of, uh, um, of, the, of the ostia, of the, of the valve. So it means that when you have a, just a single valve, you can still have um, quite good space from here, from here to try to engage your coronaries. But what happens in case this valve is going to degenerate? So you need to put another valve in. You need to put another valve in, and you have here at the level of a, of a single tubular junction, all the valve line on the aortic wall. So this patient, in case we are going to implant a valve in, we're going to have a almost 100% of uh, sinus of a salva sequestration in case we're going to implant the valve at the same uh, at the same level. So this is something that we have to consider and uh, be reminded also in case you are implanting a balloon expandable valve, the balloon expandable valve and the short frame is just, just one single element in order to obtain a good access to the coronaries. The other element is to obtain a a uh, good commissure alignment, which can be done with other devices like, like the accurate or the uh, Evolve valve, but also with the new Navitor, they, they are uh, working on that, how to align the commissures. But of course, it is something that should be considered in, when we are selecting the right valve for, this, for your patient. This is a problem also, you might say, okay, you might still do Basilica, but Basilica, remember that it might work in Redutavi, is feasible, is effective, but all it may be effective, there are not much experience on this, but this can be done and it has to be, it might be done only if commissures are well aligned. So in a case like this, in which you have a commissure, uh, in case of a perfect Basilica, you're gonna create a laceration, <coughs> sorry, just in the middle of this cup, cusp, you are not able to obtain a good access to the coronaries the same. So uh, this is another option. In case um, of uh, degeneration, uh, you may still thinking uh, not to put the valve at the same level. You may think put the valve in a lower level so that by creating this kind of leaflet of rank. And this is the Vancouver group looked at on this, some bench test. And of course, this might work all in case uh, um, you may have a, a functioning valve, or at least not a stenos valve, first valve. You can still implant a valve in a lower level with quite good action, with quite good um, uh, um, hemodynamic as demonstrated in this bench test. And this is once again, a case I want to share with you with uh, in which we, had a, um, a degenerated accurate neo valve with the, for uh, endocarditis with severe artery regurgitation. We treated this valve by implanting a valve at the lower level so that we might have uh, some kind of leaflet overhang with a very good function of the new valve and preservance of uh, the coronary access, so preserving the sinus oval salva sequestration.
And also in this case, you can see here how easy it was uh, to engage the, the right coronary artery and also the left coronary artery, you can see here. So you have uh, the valve, the old valve functioning above, if you have the new valve functioning down. Of course, you have to consider that in case you're gonna have a stenosis and a severe malfunction, so very thickened valve, so you, uh, we, we may argue whether this approach may be feasible and effective. So to conclude um, this, uh, uh, this lecture, we can say that coronary artery disease, uh, uh, we know this is very prevalent within the target population. Uh, we know the lower risk younger patients are likely to develop coronary events, especially with the progressive evolution of either coexisting or new lesions over time. PCI after TAB is not frequent, it is feasible, but it's associated with the high rates of lung success and a complication compared with no TAB accepting. And of course, uh, it's not frequent so far, but for sure it will be much more frequent in the future. We know that specific anatomical at THV patient interacting factors are associated with more challenging or even impossible coronary access after TAVI. And design of the transcatheter valve matters with THV with short frame, short stent, and open cells are proven to maintain easy coronary access. But do not forget, there is also the fact that the commission alignment is now uh, one of the most important uh, factors that can facilitate uh, the commercial, the coronary access, but also can facilitate redo procedures. Uh, so by favoring the using of Basilica. So thank you very much. And I'm really open to discussion and uh, anything Marco, great. That was really, <clears throat> as usual, I'm not surprised. Uh, fantastic. Um, let me just get the rest of the team on. Um, and as we said, a super important topic. Um, so we're gonna start with the fellows, Marco, uh, and answer their questions, and then we'll see what other questions come in from the chat, uh, if there are any questions from the chat. So I'm just gonna go according to my screen. Pier Pasquale, I see you first. Yep, um, good morning, uh, Dr. Bambanti. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I do have uh, many questions, but I'm just gonna go with a couple of them. So um, if you had a chance to choose two catheters only to have on your table, um, to access in a taber for the left and the right coronary arteries, uh, what catheter would you choose? And another question that came to my mind was, you know, whenever we have a taber in taber, a lot of our issues with uh, coronary reaccess comes from the neo, neo skirt and this new cover stent that we would have in the ascent up eventually to ascending our organ. But we obviously don't want that. So my question is, do you think a device or anything that would allow to implant the valve and actually um, put the leaflets of the first valve not on towards the you know the the upper part of the valve but actually have them go down. Do you think something like that would be feasible, or do you think embolization would be too much of a risk? Uh, do you think it's not feasible? Just wanted to know your take on this. Thank you. Well, this is not a question from a fellow. It's a question for opinion leader, actually. <laughs> uh, well, um, yeah, Perpolo, it's a very two great questions. So the first one, uh, according to my experience, I think the must have in your cath will be a JL. And I have to say that you see a lot of, um, um, of this suggestion from all, even very important operators saying that you must... You I think we may have lost Marco again. I hope not. Marco, you're frozen. Let's just call Marco and tell him he's frozen. While Marco is joining Pierre Pasquale, we'll hear his opinion as well. Uh, let's talk about catheters. Um, so for the left, okay, I re uh, where's Marco? That was okay. quick. Marco, go ahead. So catheters, great. you said JL. Uh, yes, I, had, I must have the chance to look back to my books to answer this question. Mm -hmm. um, so I know I have to say that um, uh, the JL, as I said, and probably some, some, somebody said you have to downsize, but probably the most 
uh, effective way to try to engage is to oversize. So if the JL4 in a regular patient would be good, if you are not able to reach with the tip of the catheter, the origin of the ostia, it's probably to go with a JL5 instead of a JL3.5. And this was because the GL3.5 will uh, reach, uh, will orient the tip uh, too much on the top, uh, on the roof of the sinusoval salva. This is one point. And uh, um, the EBU or extra backup catheters, I think they may be helpful, but probably they are too big and sometimes may be a little bit more challenging to engage. So my, my advice is try to engage with the JL. It's much more easy to maneuver. And in case you are not able to do a, 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 a coaxiality to have a good and selective engagement, go with a fishing technique and you, uh, use a guide extension catheter. So we used in a couple of cases and it was very successful and I had feedback from Santas. This is a very effective maneuver to do. Uh, for the right, I think the, it depends um, uh, the origin of the ostia. One of the most challenging scenario is when the right coronary artery origin from the, from the roof of uh, the sinus of Valsalva. In this case, maybe a 3D JR catheter may be the best solution, or also just the right catheter just pushing a little bit. Also, you might try to go from the wall to the, to the frame if there is enough space. Um, sometimes you don't have, particularly when you hurry with the Evolute valve. And probably you want to go, if you want to go from through the cells, probably the normal JR4 is the, the catheter we use most and the most effective one. Also in this case, you can still use a fishing technique, a guide extension catheter. Regarding the second question, um, I think it's like, uh, it might be the, uh, the cure for the cancer. <laughs> the, the fact that if you could um, do a try find a solution to do an opposite overhanging, so through towards the, um, the the ventricle instead of folding up. Um, you we know that we now have the devices uh, on the market. They are they are on, uh, ongoing. They are testing it. They made the basilic much easier to so just cut the leaflets. Um, so, but I think um, all these bench tests, deal tests were done with uh, well-functioning leaflets. So not taking at leaflets. We have to say, we have to see what happens when you have a severe stenosed valves, transcatheter valves. I think um, I can see something very hard to obtain in a, from an engineering point of view um, to make like an opposite folded up of the valve. I think we have Azim here, Latib. I think for sure he's an idea. He won't share with us uh, because this is the right way to do. But I think uh, probably um, it may be to just to do a think tank to think about that. But probably, uh, yes, if it's, I think it's a, a, with the current technology, it's almost impossible to do. Um, but um, always please keep our, our brain open to impossible solution. And this is from a technical standpoint as a background may be the perfect solution actually for this problem. Yeah, I think it's a great point. You know, we, so we, we, we thought about this a few years ago, Pier Pasquale, and we even tried with the core valve when we we're doing a valve and valve to open it a little high, okay, and then try and push really hard. Wow. You could push the leaflets down and then start implanting it. It was almost impossible because the leaflets, I mean, they, they were, they've become so rigid and so fibrotic that you can't invert them. So I, I think it's going to be a challenging uh, part. Um, I think what we will see is dedicated devices. I saw a device at PCR now in Paris that looks very easy and will remove a large piece of leaflet. Okay, so you'll actually not just lacerate, but you'll excise a piece of leaflet and remove a piece of leaflet. And so instead of just having this, you actually have you know this right because there's a big open leaf. because the problem with basilica you cut it and then you're hoping it's going to splay but sometimes it only splay this much now imagine if you actually remove the piece and now you have this the leaf has become that from that so i think we're going to see technology i saw like an amazing technology that is going to grab it use like almost electrocautery to like cut a wedge out of the leaflet and you pull out a wedge um the problem is going to be you know are you going to get severe ar if you do two leaflets, because you may have to do two leaflets, but I think the future is going to be we have to remove leaflets. 
Yeah, but um, I think uh, you might still have as an option just by placing a temporary valve down. Um, so this is, uh, you don't need if you have, uh, you don't mind if you have uh, like a mod or some kind of moderate regurg, if you have uh, like a shitty valve down there, but still you need, of course, some, some cerebral protection for sure. Uh, you need quite bulky devices for sure. Um, we're going to need for sure also a temporary valve. I just, yeah. if I have to imagine such a procedure, I would imagine like that. I, would I agree with that. you, Mark. I think you're going to need some sort of temporary valve to, because there's no, no other way to support a patient who has severe AR. So yeah. a temporary valve is the only way. Great questions, Pierre. Jesse. Uh, you're mute, Jess, you're mute. Sorry, I was, I was saying just thank you very much for a, a great talk. I think it's, it's extremely extremely relevant and especially at two in the morning when you have a STEMI and it's a TAVI patient. Um, so I have kind of one specific question and then one general question. Uh, the specific question is I noticed in the in the fishing technique, you, you recommend a hydrophilic wire. Um, and I was wondering why you'd recommend that over just a standard workhorse wire. Um, and the other question is, do you ever go uh, right radial for access in a patient with a known uh, TAVI? So the first, so good, uh, good questions. The first one was, I have to say that sometimes uh, uh, you are completely misaligned with uh, uh, the valve and uh, um, with the tip of the catheter, the guiding catheter and the origin of the ostia. I tried, it happened, it happened actually three times um, that I was not able to go with a, just PMW wire and I got it with a, just a, it was a pilot wire um, this was just my personal experience on, based on three cases so it's, it's important to, to disclose this because it, of course uh, um, this is not just the, the, the uh, just rule, general rules this is just uh, what I learned from my, from my experience I have to say that I found much easier to go with a, with a hydrophilic wire. So this is the point. But of course, you can still try um, with a, just a, uh, if you feel more comfortable, if you feel more safe, if you feel more, much safer with just a workhorse wire. Um, the, the, the advice I give to you is just to do a, a, an, at least a 50 to 60 degrees tip. On the, on the wire, because otherwise, if you live like this, you are not able, if you are not well aligned, you are not able to maneuver it. Um, this first thing. The second thing is, um, I think in this, uh, um, uh, I found that the femoral approach much easier as compared with the radial. Um, I, I have to say that I was born as a femoralist. Um, I had my fellowship as a femoralist. Um, now we split on a radial approach. So we now we do like a 95% procedures radial. Um, we tried both through the radial to the femoral, but um, with the radial, with the, with the radial sometimes much be much harder in our experience. But once again, I think the, but this is just a, a general rule for interventions. In case of something trickier, put yourself on your much more comfort zone. If your comfort zone is the radial approach, please go ahead with radial approach. If you, your comfort zone is much the femoral, go with the femoral. I have to say that femoral is, it provides you a much little bit, particularly for the right coronary, for the right coronary, a little bit more predictable way to engage it. But once again, you can still try to, to from the radial and just split, just shift, uh, split better from, from the femoral, of course. Um, the, another important point you say, as you mentioned, two o'clock in the morning for a STEMI. Um, you know, sometimes when you you have, we have, the, we are lucky that we are in an environment where we really know very well the valve. But try to figure out in a center where they really don't know, which is a supraanular, supra intraanular, balloon expandable valve, cetera, expanding valves. They just see a mesh on fluoroscopy. They really have no idea what's going on there. So probably a good, uh, as a teaching, uh, it may be good to do an Arctic angiography if you have some troubles to, to get to engage the coronaries. Or in if, if you are not engaged selectively, just do a, a semi-selective shot and let's see what's going on and then try to engage. And But uh, once again, there is like a learning curve and the technique I showed you, I think is the best one. And I found it the, the most reproducible one to engage left and the right as well. 
guys on. Thank you. Thanks, Marco. Uh, Sebastian? Yes. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, very great uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, I have only one uh, question that, ca that came into my mind when you talked about uh, sinus sequestration and basilica. Um, you know, basilica is not uh, is not performed by every center and cannot be performed by every center. Um, and many centers still or have been doing, still perform or have been performing or doing um, chimney standing um, into the aortic route. Um, just your opinion, is it is it possible to engage these chimney stands to um, to do PCI um, in the in the left main or in, um, whether left uh, left or right? But it's it's usually the left. Um, or do you think um, this should not, should not be done anymore, um, or only as a bailout strategy? Just your opinion on that. Thanks, Sebastian. So I think um, today. Um, we know chimney stenting, we know how to do it. We know that uh, at least short mid term outcomes are not so good. So I have to say that I really don't want to plan a chimney stenting. Of course, this is the sometimes maybe the only way to, to, to treat in acute fashion to save the patient. So that's exactly the, the, the right thing to do. But I really don't want to plan it. Uh, I have to say in this scenario, of course, we are going to, for sure, we're going to see some um, patient with TAVI degenerated in which CT will anticipate 100% sinus sequestration. If the patient is fit enough, if the patient is really unoperable, if the patient uh, needs treatment, okay, so you might think to plan it, but of course, this should be really the last resort. And I have to say that um, we talk about regarding the, re the surgical procedure on the degenerative valve. We know from the explant TAVI trial that mortality is very high, uh, rate of success is quite low. But I think uh, our, uh, our colleagues from surgical colleagues will improve their uh, learning experience in this. And I think um, that it's much, it's becoming much more you know, um, a good option, try to uh, not just like a, do a hybrid procedure by cutting the leaflets surgically and implanting surgery at transcatheter valve in. So you don't have to do like a aortic root replacement and uh, all the problems that could arise from surgical option uh, in a, a degenerated valve, transcatheter valve. So I think uh, we are moving to a better strategy to treat it to trans from in a transcatheter way, but also surgical uh, counterpart. And I think they are moving in the right in the right way. But chimney all in very, very, very extreme cases. Thank you. Augustine. Yes, thank you so much for this uh, amazing talk. Uh, I liked a lot the way you tried to, to prevent the disease instead of, of, of curing it. Um, you, you showed us a lot of key features in, in that uh, in that field. Uh, in your daily practice, do you have like dedicated algorithm or, or to 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 use uh, these uh, key features to avoid a coronary obstruction? Yeah, I think everybody everybody has has his own um, personal algorithm, which is also. Um, um, it, it depends also from the, from the local practice, according also to the valves you are allowed to use and so on. I think uh, in a quite medium to large volume center, you still need at least two different platforms, which is one self-expanding, well, one expandable. Ideally, three platforms would be much better. But um, yes, uh, I think a coronary artery disease, uh, if it uh, will have uh, just like a, 3% um, uh, occupancy in my mind in terms of patient selection. Um, if you're moving, if you're moving in, a, uh, in, a, in a younger patient with already some well-known coronary artery disease, for sure this 3% must be much higher. So it's like to put uh, into, um, into the, the, this big um, uh, algorithm a few things. And for sure, the risk of uh, um, sinus oval salva sequestration in, in case of reductavi and the coronary obstruction, the coronary impingement has become an important part of my 
um, uh, personal decision making. Of course, I cannot say that uh, is is a very dynamic, um, uh, the very dynamic approach. So there are some patients in which the coronary disease might have a more prevalent um, uh, rule in as compared with the conduction disturbances, for example. I can figure out a patient with a, already a pacemaker in. I really don't care to put the valve ground zero. I just prefer to put the valve just three millimeters down in order to preserve the coronary access. If we have a patient with already RBB and we have no coronary artery disease with very big sinotubular junction, I really don't care to have a supraannular or a very high implant. I rather prefer to do high implant because the coronary is not. So it's very it's very dynamic every patient so I, I always say that now patient selection in tavi has become a mess because a few years ago it was very easy self-expanding 23 26 29 and they'll self-expanding you may think about pm no more than this and that just go with about now we have uh, so many players inside and it's a uh, very tricky to come to come out with a uh, the right decision of course so the uh, Two years ago, a few years ago, I say, well, in 80% of patients, you can each you can put other valves, no matters. Today, this 80% is becoming much lower. So it's a very, it's very tricky. It is nice that you have to um, you have to face and you have to um, speak with other colleagues, you may have their own idea on this, but um, it's becoming much more interesting, you know. Yeah, well, I think you know your point about the fact that because we're treating young and younger patients, it's becoming more challenging. When we were treating patients who were 85 years and older, it was just good enough getting rid of the aortic stenosis because often the, le the valve outlived the patient, but now we have the opposite problem where you know the valves will not outlive the patient, so we need to be planning the second procedure already when we do the first. That's a great point. Andrea, you have the last question. Yes. Hi Marco, nice to see you again. I wanted to ask you uh, just this. We saw this case with a devastating outcome that you moved to do all this research and also the Revastavi, the, your study that was presented by Giuliano Slate Breaking at Bureau PCR. In that study, there was no difference whether a complete or incomplete revascularization was done before TAVI. Do you think this might change according to anatomies or specific patient subgroups? Yeah, great, great question, Andrea. So this is, uh, um, is another problem. So this is another player because we have anatomical players. We have like um, biological players. The biological players is the impact of global impact of coronary artery disease. Of course, as intervention cardiologists, we, you know, oh, we are very keen in uh, doing PCI type A lesion uh, in patients that are going to, who had TAVI, proximal LED and so on. Um, probably our approach to coronary disease in this patient, and also from a surgical perspective, has been quite aggressive. Uh, the results of the Revask Tavi um, in this particular population, so still old population, um, were absolutely um, striking. And uh, well, uh, we investigated also different subset of patients in which probably you might anticipate a much benefit, which are left proximal left main, multi-vessel disease, chest pain, uh, angina, or LV dysfunction. But the result of uh, a lack of benefit in terms of complete revascularization was consistent across all these health groups. So I think uh, now we are much more conservative in treating these patients. But of course, if you have the chance to preserve the access, we, are, we can be much more confident in uh, using this approach. Of course, if you have a patient with a two vessel disease, you wanna use a, a quite conservative approach in a 60 life, 65, 68 years old man. If you are, not, if you are going to preclude the coronaries, that's gonna be a, a problem. So I think um, the, the, the beauty of this approach of preserving the coronary access is also um, uh, stands in the fact that you can still treat the patient in the best way. The best way means sometimes just to leave the, this by clinic, by medically, so treat leave it alone without doing PCI. So yes, the, 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 the answer is you have to put this in, the, in this balance. So if you think that you cannot resolve the, the, the problem, the severe areas without precluding the coronary access in the future, and this patient had a proximal LED with a 80 by 90% stenosis, 
probably who cares about the reverse tabby results? Just do it because the reverse tabby do not take this into consideration. Um, so I think the message is be flexible. And um, I think it will be hard to, to obtain guidelines on this because it's such a big and a multivariate um, environment that it will be tricky and uh, it will be definitely up to us and up to our experience to do what is the best strategy for our patient. I think that's a great place to end. Uh, Marco, thank you for the great talk as always. Um, you know, you're very knowledgeable in this field and all of structural. And I think all of us learned so much from you this morning. Thank you for taking the time out of your day. We really appreciate it. And we look to seeing you again soon on Monte Ha. Zim, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. And uh, see you next year, Montefiore, or uh, <laughs> around. Exactly. Thank you very much.